that you would be with us. Help us understand better the incomprehensible truths about you. In your holy, precious name. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 3. I'm <clears throat> guessing, I've said it a couple times, but I'm guessing almost every sermon for the for 2024 will begin with turning your Bibles with me to Matthew. Hopefully, it will numbers will keep on growing and we won't stay too far back. But Matthew 3, starting from verse 13. This is after it's described John the Baptist and that all these people are coming from Jerusalem and Judea to be baptized by John the Baptist for a baptism of repentance. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God. Matthew 3, 13 through 17 demonstrates the place of Jesus in the Trinity. And as I saw that a few weeks ago, and we are going to go into chapter 3, I remember calling my dad and saying, I feel like maybe I should do a sermon on the Trinity, but I'm very scared to do a sermon on the Trinity. So maybe I should just smush chapter 3 into one sermon and kind of just avoid the topic because the Trinity is something that is, as I mentioned in my prayer, incomprehensible. It's above us. And it's extremely important because we're talking about who God is is. So if I say something wrong this morning, I will be saying something wrong about who God is. John Knox said, I have never once feared the devil, but I tremble every time I enter the pulpit. I have always tried to live by that statement, not fearing the devil, because I have Jesus on my side. The devil doesn't stand a chance. But I always want to tremble when I enter the pulpit. And this morning I have a little extra tremble <laughs> as we talk about the Trinity. The Trinity is incomprehensible. God is one essence. Three persons. One in three. Three in one. When, if you've gone to kindergarten math, you know that that doesn't seem to add up. What Trinity means is tri-unity. There's three, unity, three, one. What we have to recognize about this truth that is beyond us is that we're describing a God that is beyond us. You see, at the beginning, God created time, matter, and space. That's what happens in Genesis chapter 1. So God is before time, matter, and space. And that's an even, even an inaccurate statement because I said before, which is a measurement of time. <laughs> this concept here that we're talking about is truly beyond us. C.S. Lewis encouraged us in this when atheists would come to him and say you know that's so god's so confusing the trinity is so confusing you just can't get it so he can't be god it can't be true if we don't understand it and c.s lewis said if we were able to understand god in human terms he wouldn't be god he'd be a man 
I think that's very true. True. You know, I think I've heard quite a few comments about depth that I go into on Sunday mornings. Um, some very positive, some a little like, why do we have to go so deep? Like, it's just, whew, so, why are we going so deep? This week might be a little bit deeper than most weeks. <laughs> I went in the other direction. <clears throat> I've been doing what I call spiritual hydroplaning all week. You know, hydroplaning is when you're driving and it's a little wet and you kind of skate over the ground a little bit. You're like above the ground, kind of like floating above the ground. And I, the way I've been thinking about it is I've been floating above what my brain can actually comprehend as I've been exploring and digging into the Trinity. I watched a bunch of videos, read a bunch of different books, a series of lectures that I would highly recommend for you if, if you want to hide your plane. Um, is to go and look up on YouTube R.C. Sproul Lectures on the Trinity. And he has quite a few lectures on YouTube, and it'll dizzy you, but I think you'll come away from those having a better knowledge of who God is. You see, God is incomprehensible. It's true. But he is knowable. God has made himself present in time, matter, and space, present in our world, so that we can know him. And no, we're not going to understand everything about him, but we can know him, and we can grow in knowing him better. He is a mystery to us. That's true but a mystery we can understand more and more of. One thing he is not is a contradiction. If you ever hear someone say that the Trinity is a contradiction, it's not a contradiction to say that God is three in one. It's a paradox, which means something that seems contrary, but is true. And it's a mystery how those things work together, but he's not a contradiction, because if he was a contradiction, then he wouldn't be true. And we know that God is... <coughs> True. Okay, Levi, you go so deep, and you're going to go even deeper this morning. You've already gone all metaphysical on us and talked about outside of time, matter, and space. Why? Why can't you just be simpler? Why can't we just say, you know, I love Jesus. Isn't that enough? You know, oh, what do you think about this about God? Well, let me explain to you, and then another person will say, well, I just love Jesus. It's good to just love Jesus. But if you, if we sent Ashley into the other room, and you asked me questions about her, how tall is she? What's her eye color? What's her hair color? And I didn't know the answer. But I said, I just love her. Well, what is she like? I, I just love her. <laughs> well, what's her family like? I just love her. If I just answered everything with I just love her, you would start to question whether I just love her. Or if I just want to claim her. I think that's what we do sometimes with God. We want to claim her. But we don't actually love him. We're called to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mind is included in there. We're told in Colossians 3.1 to set our minds on things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. On that back wall where we show our mission statement, we say that we're a Christ-centered, missional family. How can you understand Christ without understanding the Trinity? How can you understand being missional without baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And how can you understand what true unity is without understanding the unity between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit?
when we look at the Trinity, we discover who God is more. We discover how he works in this world, how he can work through us to achieve missions. And we make a doctrine that we can hold fast on and be in unity together on. The Trinity is kind of a pass word. When you knock at the door of someone in the faith and you say, do you believe in the Trinity? If they cannot say yes to that, then they are not a Christian. Go and ask a Mormon that knows Mormon theology. Do you believe in the Trinity? They will not be able to answer yes because they're not truly Christian. You see, we want unity. We want to be a family. But we want to be a family centered in Christ. And Paul, when he speaks on unity, he writes a whole book about unity called 1 Corinthians. And he says at the beginning of that, in verse, chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, all of our unity at any cost, people are like, yes, but they leave out the back half of this verse. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's not just about being united and being in the same space. It's about being mind united in the same mind. And understanding the Trinity and what we believe about the Trinity can help us be united in the same mind in our understanding of who God is. So this morning we're going to explore two questions for the note takers. Two questions. First, who is the Trinity? Or if you want to get a little trippy, who are the Trinity? Because both of those questions work. And the second question, what does Matthew 3, 13 through 17 teach us about the Trinity? You see, over the course of human history, we have understood the Trinity, we've understood God more and more. From Adam till now, we continue to understand God more and more. It's called progressive revelation. What I want to point out about the truths that I'm going to share here is that just because God revealed these truths throughout time, progressively, he didn't change. The knowledge of him changed. Our understanding of him changed. And just like I know Ashley better today than I knew her the day that I met her, we as a people know God better than the day that we met him as humans and as individuals, hopefully. We all learn gradually. And that's okay. That's one encouragement I would have for you. If what you just heard me say is, hey, it's important to know about the Trinity, it's important to know about God, to have convictions about this, and if you are one of those people that just says, hey, well, I just love Jesus, and you don't have the same understanding as I do, or the same understanding as the person next to you, I don't want you to hear me saying, hey, that means you don't love Jesus because you don't understand Jesus as good as I do. No, 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 no. God reveals his truth to you progressively. And hopefully this morning, you will understand who God is a little bit better than you did when you came in. That's the goal of when we meet together, to grow together in Christ and in our knowledge of him and in our love of him in our soul, heart, mind, and even our strength. Although the Trinity wasn't a word used until the third century AD, we see the Trinity all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. The Father creates and what's over the face of the waters? The Spirit. We find out in John chapter 1 that the agent that God created everything through is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word 
was God. We discover that he was an active agent in this creation. But we don't even have to go to John chapter 1 to discover that Jesus is present in Genesis chapter 1 because it says, let us create man in our image. First of all, God is saying that and he's speaking in the plural. So one God, three persons. Second of all, what does 1 Colossians 1.15 tell us about Jesus? That Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So when God says, let us create man in our image, the Son steps forward. And that's the image that they're talking about. Jesus is the image that we were created after. The Father creates. And we see, even though you hear sometimes, people will overemphasize that Jesus called God the Father and told us to do the same when we pray. And you, you'll hear sometimes people talk about how profound that is and how in that time people would have been offended by that. It's true that they would have been offended that there is this dad relationship. But it's not true that they didn't recognize him as the father. And Isaiah, Isaiah calls God the father multiple times, saying that he's the creator of all things. We see that throughout the entire Old Testament, that God, is, God the father is the creator. We see that God the Father is also the ordainer of everything that happens. It says in Proverbs 16, 33, that the lot is cast into the lap. The dice are cast, cast into the lap. And every decision is from the Lord. There's no role that you can make of the dice that wasn't decided beforehand. The New Testament clarifies this when it talks about sparrows. Jesus talks about sparrows. And he says in chapter 10, verse 29 and 30, that God cares for the sparrow. Not one of them falls apart from the Father. That even the hairs on our head are numbered. So every time you get a haircut, God knew, and he knew how many would change. He knew this morning that I would have three years less. <laughs> God ordains all things. And we find out in the New Testament that he even ordains our salvation in one way or another. Now you can come to different um, interpretations of this passage about how God does all these things, but it says in Ephesians 1, Verse, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved you see god ordains even salvation and how does he do this by sending the son that is the active role of the father you see they're all united in one purpose the trinity is united in one purpose but they have different roles in accomplishing that purpose. The Father sends. He sends the Son, and the Father and the Spirit, and the, the Father and the Son send the Spirit. We see this even in the Old Testament, and things called Christophanies. I, I, I debated with my dad whether it should be Christophanies. I'm not sure. But we see Jesus throughout the Old Testament. 
Who wrestles with Jacob? The Lord. Who appears as an angel or a messenger of the Lord and judges? He says, I am the Lord your God. The angel says that? Why does the angel say that? Because the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Who shows up with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace? That's the Son. The image of God. When he comes in the New Testament, he is born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He lives a perfect life. He died on a cross for our sins, was buried, rose again on the third day, appeared to many. He then ascended to heaven, where he now intercedes for us, sitting at the right hand of the Father. One day, he will return to judge the living and the dead. The Son accomplishes. The Father sins, the Son accomplishes. What about the Spirit? Where's the Spirit in the Old Testament? Well, we already mentioned one place. He's over the waters at the creation. We see him at the Passover, passing over the houses that have blood on them and killing the firstborn of every house that does not have the blood on the ceiling. We see him resting on the kings, empowering them, giving the word to the prophets. We see him in the tabernacle, falling like flame into the tabernacle, falling like flame into the temple. We see him in this passage resting on Jesus. We know from Isaiah that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. We see here that he was, that the Spirit rested on him. And right after this, if you peek a little ahead to chapter 4 of Matthew, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was Spirit led. He was able to have the Spirit in this way because he was holy, as the Spirit was holy. And after his atoning sacrifice, Jesus' atoning sacrifice for our sins, we, too, in the eyes of God, became holy. And that is why we now have access to the Holy Spirit. And we see the Holy Spirit descending like fire on the church at Pentecost. We are told that he convicts the world of sin. We are told that he will remind us of Christ's teachings, including inspiring the apostles as they wrote the New Testament. He now gives us gifts for the sake of those who believe and all those who will. Holy Spirit does a whole lot. Again, so far what I've talked about, that's all in the Bible. So, when someone tells you the Trinity is a word that was made up in the 3rd to 5th centuries of after Christ's death, you can say, you're right, that word was made up then. To describe something that is clearly in the scriptures, we see each person of the Trinity throughout the entire Bible. If there's one thing that you take away from this morning, we've been hydroplaning maybe a little bit, that's okay. For the note takers, the Father sends, the Son acquires, or accomplishes would be another word, and the Holy Spirit applies. The Holy Spirit testifies. Okay, so why are we talking about this? We haven't spent a lot of time in the passage this morning. Ooh, that's okay. Might be a little bit of a longer morning, friends. Big idea. Here's our second question. 
What does Matthew 3, 13 through 17 teach us about the Trinity? It primarily teaches us about the role of the Son in the Trinity. We see the affirmation that Jesus was the Son of God. John the Baptist, who is a very noteworthy minister during this time, sees Jesus coming and he says, Hey, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. Why does he say that? Because he recognizes this, that, that this man that has no renown yet is God. The Father affirms Jesus, by calling him his son, in whom he is well pleased. The Spirit testifies by resting on him. We see that this passage affirms that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, I have an illustration for this. I'm terrified of the illustrations when we're talking about the Trinity, because we're trying to illustrate something with human ideas that is above us. So this illustration falls very short, okay? Okay. I'm going to say it again. This illustration falls very short. Don't take it too seriously. But it might help a little. It helped Ashley when I was explaining. Imagine that I forgot my water up here. And I went back to upload the sermon um, after the service. And there's still some of you wandering around up here. And William comes in. And I, I'm kind of thirsty. Comes into my office. So I tell William, hey, buddy, can you go get my water from the front? Peter Patterson. He runs out here. He's coming to get my water. And someone stands in front of him and says, what are you doing? Let's say Ashley comes up behind him in support of him. Stand behind him to say, he has my authority. And I hear this from my office and I call out, he's giving my water. He has my permission and my authority then that person would say, oh, okay, I see what you've come to do, and I accept that. Jesus was sent in the authority of the Father, and the Father calls out to say, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit, who's not Mother God, don't, don't overuse the illustration, but the Spirit comes and rests on him, to demonstrate that he has the authority of the Spirit as well. What's our place in this? You may notice in your bulletins that it's the same sermon title from last week. This week it's probably the Trinity would be the sermon title. But the sermon last week was called It's Not About You. And guess what? It's still not about you. If we want an application from this, it's to look at John the Baptist again and just be, he, he stands up and he goes, hey, it's not about me. I can't baptize you. And then Jesus says, no, you will. And then he says, okay. Whatever you want. That's the heart that we should have. That's what we should learn from this passage. It also teaches us not only that Jesus is the Son of God, but that he is truly man. He is truly God. He is truly man. And what we have to recognize is that in this passage, we find out that the incarnation of Christ, that Christ came into the likeness of man, was a Trinitarian act. All three members of the Godhead, the Trinity as a whole, sent Jesus to do everything that he did. And what did he do that the Father affirms and the Spirit testifies? The Creator took on creaturely flesh. Why did he get baptized? Have you ever thought that? John is baptizing with a baptism of repentance. Jesus was sinless. Why did he repent? He says to fulfill all righteousness. He's fulfilling all righteousness because he brought himself so low to take on human flesh. And now in his life, he accomplishes every act that man is called to do. Everything. He was even circumcised on the seventh day, like specific law says he has to do. 
so that his circumcision can stand in place of ours. That's why we no longer have to be circumcised. He obeyed every single one of the Ten Commandments. He obeyed all of the law. He accomplished it. He finished it. Jesus, in choosing to be man, in his manhood, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. As a man, he stepped into time, into a physical, damageable body. Matter. He even chose not to know everything as a man. We see that when he said, talks about the second coming. He says, not even the Son of Man knows when the end will come. He chose as a man to come into space, matter, and time. We can't forget that as God, Jesus was and is and will be outside of time, matter, and space. That he is omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipresent. He is everywhere in all time. He's immutable, unchangeable. He retains all of the attributes of God in the fact that he is truly God. And he takes on the attributes of man and that he is truly man. Hydroplaning a little bit? Talking about something above our pay grade? Name one other thing that has two natures. You can't. He is the only one. And he did that. He brought himself that low for us. It's almost like if you were writing a book and you wrote yourself into the story. That character in the story would be confined to that section of that book. He would be confined by the rules that you had placed in that story. But that doesn't mean that you outside of that book is confined to those things. Again, that's an illustration. Falls somewhat short. Don't take it too seriously. But it kind of helps. See what he did for you in doing that. See what Christ did in humbling himself. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What do we see? What do we learn from Matthew 3, 13 through 17 about the Trinity? We learn that Jesus brought himself so low for us and that the whole Trinity supported him and called him to do that. Affirm him as he did that. We see that the Father sent him that the Son would accomplish what needed to happen. That he would acquire our salvation. And we even see how the Spirit rests on him. And then, because He, Christ makes us holy, can come. he can now come and rest on us. That he can apply what Jesus did. The Father sends. The Son acquires. The Spirit applies. The Father sins. The Son accomplishes. The Spirit testifies. This morning we're going to remember what Jesus did for us. We're going to remember what he was sent here to do. What he acquired for us. When we take communion, that's what we are remembering. Is our new covenant with him. If someone could lower the screen before we go into this time of communion, I want us to say something together. If you believe in Christ as your Savior, we invite you to take communion. If you don't, please just let it go to the side. Before we take communion, let's make this proclamation of our faith in the Apostles' Creed.
Do you have that back there, Amy? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Next slide. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's go into a time of communion.